While Sihanouk ruled, there was little support for communist ideas in the rest of the countryside. He pushed for reforms to deny any chance to the radicals. Both health and education were top priorities. For the first time, schooling was extended free to all Cambodian children. And that included girls who were never accepted in the old pagoda schools run by monks. Education boomed throughout the 1950s and 60s. Just a decade after the French had gone, there were four times as many students. Universities also mushroomed. There was none at all before independence, but now Sihanouk had opened several. As more and more students enrolled, however, the boom was inviting problems. There was a clamour for government jobs and a taste for urban living. Cities and towns were a magnet. Any schooling at all meant rising expectations and a chance to escape from work on the land. Like most developing countries, Cambodia wanted symbols of progress and the trappings of modernization. To fund the new development, Sihanouk depended on foreign aid from America, France and other Western countries. But as the big powers vied for influence in the third world, Sihanouk also turned to the communist bloc for economic aid. Sihanouk wanted a greater stake for Cambodians in their own economy. So in the 1960s, he launched a drive to nationalize the import-export trade and other key industries. This was a bid to wrest control from local Chinese merchants who dominated commerce. The results were a minor disaster. State corporations were corrupt and badly managed. They were no match for Chinese business efficiency. But despite the failures of nationalization, Sihanouk was firmly entrenched. He was not about to be toppled by domestic problems. Cambodia's peace, however, was constantly overshadowed by the conflicts on its borders. When Viet Minh forces overran the French at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, that was the close of just one chapter in the struggle for Indochina. The French had been humiliated, but the Geneva Agreement to end the war was doomed to fail when America refused to endorse the settlement. The Geneva Agreement declared both Laos and Cambodia neutral. But Vietnam was divided north and south between the pro and anti-communists. The agreement was broken, and fighting flared in the south almost as soon as the French had departed. Nothing, it seemed, could stop the new war from engulfing neutral Cambodia. America now stepped in. It was backing the South Vietnamese under the rule of No Dinh Diem. President Diem was a Roman Catholic and bitterly opposed to the Viet Cong and communist North Vietnam. On the other side, the Soviet Union and China were backing Ho Chi Minh against the might of America and its anti-communist allies. With the superpowers bent on destruction, how would Cambodia survive as a neutral? Everything hinged on Sihanouk's personal diplomacy. He chose the path of non-alignment, no military pacts or alliances. He depended on America and France to back his neutrality. But like it or not, he would also deal with the communist camp. He went out of his way to garner the friendship of China, the communist Vietnamese, and the Soviet Union as well. Sihanouk was walking a tightrope, but his aim was to play off the big powers against each other and leave Cambodia out of their war.
But November 1963 would prove to be a turning point. The Americans backed a coup d'etat against their own ally in South Vietnam. President Ngo Dinh Diem was overthrown and assassinated. Sihanouk was shaken. If that's how America dealt with an ally, what would they do to a neutral? It may be a matter of months or several years, declared Sihanouk, but the United States cannot win a military victory in Vietnam. Within two weeks of Ngo Dinh Diem's fall, Sihanouk ordered the Americans out of Cambodia. And regardless of cost to his tiny economy, he refused to accept any further American aid. He was adamant that any reliance on the United States was now a peril. To Sihanouk, there was only one power with a genuine interest in keeping Cambodia neutral. He turned to China. There was no question of military links. Sihanouk's gamble was based on the strength of his personal friendship with China's premier, Zhou Enlai. I had much admiration for Chu Enlai. He was a great statesman, a man with a good heart, um, and he was very, very uh, popular in China. We met Chu Enlai and uh, myself. It was in April 1955 in Bandung, so uh, we became friends since then. He used to tell me that uh, um, I was the symbol of an independent, neutral, and uh, peaceful Cambodia. In the eyes of Uncle Sam, Sihanouk was courting the devil. But despite America's phobia, it was not a threat from China or even communism that Sihanouk had to fear. The paramount threat to Cambodia would always be the Vietnamese, whatever political mask they wore. He needed to come to terms with the communist side before their victory and to use the clout of China to restrain the Vietnamese. Although China was backing Ho Chi Minh with massive aid and war materials, like Sihanouk, the Chinese leaders were wary of Hanoi's ambitions. The Vietnamese would be a thorn in China's flank if they were allowed to dominate all of Indochina after the war was won. As the war in Vietnam grew, the United States became more and more frustrated. And one of its greatest frustrations was the Viet Cong's use of sanctuaries behind the Cambodian border. In addition, men and supplies from North Vietnam were crossing Cambodian soil as a lifeline to the communist forces. These were the famous Ho Chi Minh Trail. Neutral Cambodia was no longer virgin. Sihanouk denied the violations at first, but in fact he had struck a deal with the communist Vietnamese. In return for their use of Cambodia, they agreed to respect her existing borders after the war was over. Sihanouk explained his position 20 years later. I could see clearly that the Americans one day would like to uh, quit to live in the China and North Vietnam would be uh, the winner. So I made uh, my best. I, 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 I made uh, all efforts uh, to uh, get the gratitude uh, of, of the Vietnamese for my Cambodia reason why I helped them. I, I did not want to uh, do harm to the United States. I uh, like uh, Western culture. I do not speak uh, Vietnamese. My wife uh, is half French. Half Cambodian, no Vietnamese blood. <laughs> I did not concur any Vietnamese girl when I was a playboy. <laughs> so uh, I have uh, no connection with Vietnam. 